Hey, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Connecting a Smart Factory to the Cloud with MQTT and Sparkplug. No software installation required. I am happy to introduce you all to our speakers for today. Uh, Ian Scarrett, who is Head of Marketing at HiveMQ. Jeff Pepper, who is Executive Director of Business Development at Canary Lab. Benson Hogland, VP of Marketing and Product Marketing Strategy at Opto22. Ben Ockert, who is Senior Application Engineer at Opto22. And Garrick Richard, uh, who is also the Senior Application Engineer at Opto22. Ian, Jeff, Benson, Ben, Garrick, everyone, thank you for taking time and being here today. Uh, before we get started, I would like you all to know that we are recording this session and all participants will be on mute. Uh, we will be running a live 15 minute Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, uh, and if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them into the Q&A box in your control panel. Uh, if we cannot answer them all, we will answer them at a later point of time. So now without further ado, I will turn the time over to Ian. Welcome everyone. Great, thank you Jayashree and, and welcome everyone. Um, as Jayashree said, my name's Ian Scarrett. Um, and today we're very pleased to present to you the, this webinar around connecting uh, Smart Factory to the cloud with MQT and, and Sparkplug. Um, as Jayashree mentioned, we have uh, two partners with us, um, Benson from Opto22 and, and Jeff from Canary Labs. Um, for those who might not know, um, Opto22 is an industrial hardware manufacturer who makes uh, the Groove, uh, Epic and Rio PLCs, which we're gonna be showcasing today in, in the demonstration. And Canary Labs um, is, is a, a well-known historian that really lets you to visualize the industrial data that you get from, from your, from your uh, different uh, assets and, and factories. So we're thrilled to have uh, these, these uh, uh, two gentlemen here with us. Um, we're going to be doing a really amazing demo. Um, and what I'm hoping that this webinar will, will kind, of, kind of provide for you is really a better understanding of, of Sparkplug and MQT and how they help with uh, kind of industry for all or digital transformation projects. Um, and, but also <clears throat> equally important is how um, managed cloud solutions can help really make it easy to get going and, and get started with, with your industry for all solutions. Um, so the, 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 the demonstration is, is we we're going to do a live demo where we start from the, the Opto22 devices, connect them to HiveMQ Cloud, um, have the, the information um, flow through into the Canary Labs historian, and then start to showcase some of the, the, the cool um, graphs that you can get there. Um, we're going to do this all in 30 minutes. It's completely live. There's nothing canned. Um, so it's it's going to be quite the experience. And so, and so wish us luck when we get to it. Um, before we get to uh, the, the demo, I'd like to kind of talk a bit about uh, MQG and Sparkplug and kind of what, why, why it matters and why, why we think it's, these are important um, components in, in your technology strategy. Um, and so really at the, the kind of the most basic task when you're trying to connect a, a smart factory, you're, you're trying to connect a, a, some type of, of, of a piece of equipment for in this case, uh, kind of a group at, at Epic um, to send the data to some type of application so in our case would be a, a historian, um, the Canary Labs historian. And so that's really in the simpler case that, that we're trying to accomplish here. But as we all know, kind of the simple case never exists in reality. A, a factory um, or a deployment will have uh, hardware from multiple vendors, um, a lot of them legacy vendors that kind of are here with the Siemens and um, Bradley um, hardware. And there we're trying to get data all into the same historian here. Um, so there's lots of work that needs to be done with, with normalizing the data to be able to do that. Um, and then, when you kind of start to expand that, that use case into more complex, if you have multiple locations, if you start to add different applications where you're trying to get the data to, you start to get a lot of these pairwise integrations um, that really start to, to hinder the flexibility and, and the robustness of, of your overall, uh, overall, overall solution. Um, and in fact, kind of today, I would say, submit that that many of the existing OT systems that we have deployed today are very siloed systems, um, kind of driven by vendor proprietary protocols, um, and really these pairwise integrations that have kind of kind of 
grown over time to, to provide the functionality that you're looking for. And the, the, the challenge here is, is that, that these, these, this, these systems are not very flexible. Um, and what we find to, to kind of today with, with the, the OT systems is that changing them is, um, is, is quite cumbersome. It's, it's time resourceful, it's expensive. Um, so changing any of the workflows or processes is, 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 is a hindrance. Um, the other thing is, is that if you want to do any data analysis across the entire system, um, it becomes very problematic because these, the data is in, in silos. Um, and this is, becomes really important when you want to introduce things like machine learning or, or, or AI or any type of analytics um, across your entire system. Um, so if you're thinking about doing predictive maintenance, um, this becomes a problematic if you don't aren't able to, to get data, consistent data from, from across your systems. And finally, if you want to kind of set up new, new systems, new, new facilities, kind of, kind of introduce new hardware into a system, um, that again can be really pro problematic. Um, and we're going to see in the demonstration today of uh, kind of a, a new piece of equipment coming in and it's automatically there when, as soon as it joins. Um, so we really hope to kind of showcase some of the flexibility that, that you get with something like an MQT spark plugs um, situation. And really where, where we think um, kind of we, we need to start thinking about is, is more decoupled architectures um, where uh, the, the, the equipment um, is, doesn't know about the applications um, that that's communicated to. So you've, you've got a common source of, uh, for, for the data where the applications can get, get the data from and the, the, the hardware can, um, the equipment can publish data, data to. Um, and and this, this kind of decoupled type of style of architecture um, is really where we see um, best implemented with, with something like a protocol um, by, by um, MQT protocol. Now, MQTT has been around a long time. It was actually um, created in the 90s um, for, for oil and gas pipeline monitoring. Um, but it's actually emerged to be, become kind of a very popular um, and very successful IoT protocol across many different industries. HiveMQ is, itself has been, been involved with MQT for, for, for a long time. Um, and we see it being used much more now in, in manufacturing and industrial automation. So at the core, HiveMQ is a publish subscribe protocol. And because it's publish subscribe, um, you can start to decouple the devices and the applications where the, the devices can publish the information, um, the devices and the applications subscribe to, to the information that it wants to get. Um, MQT has been proven to be scalable, extensible, robust, and reliable. Um, we have many, many customers um, that deploy millions of, of clients um, connecting to the broker kind of with, with very high throughput. Our largest client has over, well over 250 million uh, clients connecting to, to their broker. So, so MQT is, is, is very well established to, for, for doing kind of industrial grade type, type applications. <clears throat> but what, so MQTT itself, though, is just a protocol. It's a very simple, lightweight protocol, and that, by nature, is, is the power of it. Um, what it doesn't do is add a lot of context to the messages, the, to the data. Um, and if you're looking for uh, to have a kind of a truly interoperable system be, be across different uh, vendors, you really need to get to something that, that has, the, the, where the data has contacts. And this is where Sparkplug um, comes in. Um, so Sparkplug is a standard that's being specified at the Eclipse Foundation, which has allowed the MQT projects too, so it's a natural fit. Um, and what Sparkplug adds to MQT is a consistent topic namespace for all the devices to publish on. Um, and all the applications to subscribe to. It also adds a, a data model and a structure to the data. Um, and we'll see that kind of the value of that in the demonstration where the historian can kind of start to pick up the, the data um, from, from the up to 22 devices because it, it kind of knows the, what the data model is going to be. Um, Sparkplug also allows you to kind of have an extensible process variable and it defines a MQT state management. So when a device comes into a system, um, they're kind of the birth 
uh, it knows how to kind of add a, a new device into a system. And when a device leaves, it knows what type of messages that need to be conveyed when a device leaves the system. So it's very powerful in, in terms of that. And what really what you get from um, Sparkplug are some kind of some key concepts that I think we'll we'll see in 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 the demonstration. Um, so for instance, so continuous session awareness, where you basically kind of the the clients are always there, and that actually allows you to do bi-directional communication. Report by exception. So instead of polling for for tags, um, you move to you just publish when a tag uh, or a value changes um, to, into the system. And interoperability with a consistent data format. So we've we've talked about that before. Um, auto discovery. So basically, when a new client or a new device is added to the system, um, Sparkplug makes sure everyone knows it's there. Right, which is which is very powerful for, to, to, to see. Um, and finally, we, we get a unified namespace, which basically means that each participant in a Sparkplug system is using the same name, namespace, um, which provides a lot of flexibility in, in terms of the, 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 the integration of, of new, new components. <clears throat> So really where we get to is a, an architecture, a Sparkplug architecture that's such as this, where um, on the left-hand side, you have what we're called in Sparkplug terminology, edge of network nodes. So these could be gateways. Um, uh, they can be PLC, more modern PLCs or, or more modern devices that know how to speak Sparkplug. Um, the gateways can actually take data from existing legacy um, equipment um, that might might may, may speak OPC UA or Modbus or kind of different digital and analog um, uh, inputs and outputs. And we'll see this in the demonstration. That edge network nodes communicate through a broker. In this case, would be HiveMQ. Um, and then what are called application nodes, right? Where are the different types of applications that can connect to the data through through the broker, and with us uh, with a SCADA system, kind of doing the overall coordination. So that's kind of at a very high level, kind of what, what a Sparkplug architecture looks like. So what we want to do now is kind of go to to switch to the demo. And um, like as I said, I wanted to give you a quick introduction. There's, we've got lots of resources to, to, to draw upon for more information. But for the demonstration, what we're going to do is basically take that spark plug, spark plug architecture and split it into two kind of conceptually, where the devices um, are going to be basically um, in the Opto 22 offices in California. Um, they're going to be con connecting to um, some cloud instances that we have. Um, so we're going to be running the, the broker and the story on, on, on AWS instances. Um, and so this, this kind of connectivity, right, will be going through secure communication. So we're going to be using TLS for sure. There's actually bi-directional um, communication that, that's uh, available. But, but also the important thing to realize is that these devices aren't actually exposed to the internet. They're, they communicate through the broker. Um, so you, they're not addressable um, kind of in, independently. So, so it's, it's kind of going to be a, a kind of a fun demo to show. Um, so kind of more specifically how, how this is going to work is the Opto 22 devices are going to be in the California offices of the Opto 22 um, in, in, in California. Um, they actually will, the Epic, Roof Epic will be pulling data from, I believe, a Siemens and, and an Allen Bradley um, a piece of equipment. They're going to be generating Sparkplug messages um, that are, will be sent to HiveMQ Cloud, which is HiveMQ's managed um, MQD service. This is actually running on an AWS region in Frankfurt. Um, and then Canary um, the, will, with their, the, uh, with their hosted solution called Canary Axiom, um, <clears throat> will be subscribing to these, uh, the Sparkplug messages. Um, and Canary is going to be actually running on AWS region and the East Coast of the US. So this is very much a kind of a transatlantic um, uh, demonstration. And I think the really cool thing about this is, is that the latency you'll see real time is, is pretty minimal. Um, so so re it's really a compelling uh, story for, for us to be able to tell. And But the important thing is, is that we're not going to install any st software. These are managed solutions that are already there and available today to, to for you to, to, to use. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop my, my screen sharing here. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Benson, who's going to start the demonstration. Great. Well, thank you, Ian. I appreciate that. Uh, nice overview of the, um, of the demo equipment. 
you know, so often we attend one of these webinars that show all these cloud services and moving data around, but it's always is with simulated data. And so we thought we'd uh, do something a little bit more daring, uh, perhaps a little more exciting, uh, where we're going to actually use real OT devices from brownfield systems like legacy PLCs and so on. And so right here behind me, and of course on your screen that you can see now, uh, we've actually got a Groove Epic there, uh, right there in the middle. I'll put my finger out there so you can see it. Uh, this is a PLC and a gateway combined into one. And what's uh, interesting about this is that we're actually are connecting to these legacy PLCs. We'll be pulling all the tags from those PLCs over a separate segmented private network, uh, putting that uh, data into MQTT spark plug messages, and then pushing them out on an outbound basis over the IT network and connecting up to HiveMQ Cloud. So we're gonna configure the broker in there to do that, which is not configured at this moment uh, because we're actually gonna tilt up a broker just for this exercise. Now, the second one I'm also gonna show is something here right next to me. Uh, this is a Groove Rio, slightly different. This is more of an IO system and gateway. And on this device, we've got a lot of uh, sensors and so on. In fact, I'll give you a, a quick little tour uh, first is a little temperature sensor we have right here, uh, just measuring temperature here in the room or in my uh, sweaty palm. Uh, and then second to that, I've got a, a nice little door sensor, very uh, in inexpensive dry contact door sensor. I can see right there that the light goes on when I'm closing the contact. Uh, pretty cool. And then right here behind me, you can see I've got a, a, a column of water <laughs> and inside I've got a what's called a four to 20 milliamp transmitter. Uh, it's a, called a level rat. And it's gonna tell me what the, the um, height of that water is, the, how much is in the tank. So we're gonna take all that information and also from this device and the Epic behind me, publish both of those uh, sets of data up to the broker for Jeff over in on the East Coast to subscribe to and start to do some trending, some analysis and so on. So I'm gonna click over to, uh, to here so that you can see what my, um, let me switch to here, because the first thing I'm gonna do is log into the Rio. So that's the uh, really the first step is show you how that configuration occurs. Now, both Groove Epic and Groove Rio, these devices are designed to be on the plant floor. They are minus 20 to 70 degrees C, UL listed, class one, div two, DIN rail mountable, the whole nine yards. So they're designed to be uh, put in challenging areas. Uh, and they all both run off of Ethernet. Uh, this Rio actually runs off of power over Ethernet. So it's really simple to install to get some sensor information quickly. But most importantly, these devices that go down into the OT area are secure. So they only allow access to the device over a secure channel. So what I'm going to do is actually log into this Rio here. And I've got a shortcut there. And indeed, it presents me with a login page. Uh, and of course, I'll go ahead and log in there. And this is a web pages that are being served directly from the device. It has a HTTPS web server in there. And indeed, I'm connected with a valid certificate to this device. There's a lot going on here, and we don't have time in this webinar to cover all that. We're going to focus on the task at hand. The first thing is to show you a few of the channels that I just described and how they were configured. And indeed, this screen is presenting that information now. So I can see my demo studio temperature. I can see my door sensor. And I can see that I have a red stack light that's on and also a level trans, uh, transducer there. So how did, that, how did that get configured? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I click in and I can see some details about this particular sensor. And when I click on configure, this is where the magic starts. The first step uh, in any digital transformation application is to identify what tags you're going to work with and how to put those into a unified namespace. So indeed, when I created this particular temperature sensor, I gave it a name. That name is its tag. And that tag, that tag name, proliferates through the entire system. So it really is the first step in creating that unified namespace that we care so much about in the digital transformation space. Now, the other kind of cool thing about this little Rio is it has eight channels of completely software configurable IO. And that simply means I can choose from a long list of different signal types. So the notion of being able to quickly gather data information from a sensor perspective or even the existing PLCs becomes just a software configuration right on the hardware. So I choose the temperature probe. I'm in good shape. A lot of other details here we'll skip over for now because I wanna focus on this. This is public access. 
public access is what data values do I want to send under that tag name? So in this case, I certainly want to send the temperature value, what the current temperature is. And because we're using MQTT and Spark Plug B, I'm only going to send that temperature on change. In this case, the dead band zero. So any change in temperature, I will publish a message to the broker. Uh, and in this case, we're going to actually use the HiveMQ Cloud Basic Broker, a free broker with over 100 devices or with 100 devices we can connect to. I'm also going to send the minimum and maximum values that were ever reached while this device was powered on. So as you can see, I can have multiple data values for a single sensor. Let's go back and I'll show you the door sensor here. And once again, as you can see, I've just got a door sensor there as I turn it on and off. We'll look at the configuration. Uh, and again, uh, this is software configured as a switch input, a simple dry contact, very simple. Uh, and it's also configured as a counter. So as I move this door switch back and forth, I'm actually counting how many times that happened. And as you can see down here, I'll be sending the counts as well up to the broker. And then finally, we'll take a look at the four to 20 milliamp transmitter, which is my level rate sen sensor and go ahead and configure that. Same idea, choose from the type and I'll be sending the value. In this case, I'm, I do have a dead band uh, just so I'm not publishing any jitter that may occur at that sensor. Uh, just reduce the amount of messages, but still give us relevant data, uh, meaningful data that can be used wherever it needs to be. Okay. That was a sensor configuration, pretty straightforward. I had these uh, already pre-wired, of course. And on the Epic, we have the, that connected to the PLCs and have already pulled the data in over there. The next step is where do we send the data, right? So MQTT is the way to go. And one of the challenges that we often face, particularly in the industrial arena, is you know, what's a broker and how do I get one installed and where do I install it and what kind of server do I need and, and so on and so forth. And for us, we think that you know, this new offer by HiveMQ with the Cloud Basic uh, free, you know, free trial, actually it's more than a trial, you can continue using it as long as you need to, that's the way to go. So we're gonna actually set that up. But first, let me go into where we configure MQTT on this device and it's similarly configured on the Epic behind me. As you can see, I'm not configured currently. So I'm gonna go into configuration. And the first step is defining what's called the topic namespace. And that's broken down into basically three parts. So we've got the group ID, the edge node ID, and the device ID. And this essentially creates a folder structure for you to place your various uh, MQTT tags and so on in, so that when we go and browse those tags later, they're all structured as, as uh, defined by the unified namespace or the topic namespace. So in this case, I'll go ahead and type in, um, I'm gonna go opto22 is my, groove I, uh, my group ID. My edge node ID, I'm gonna call groove Rio. And I'll look at my notes to make sure I'm on track. And indeed on this device ID, this is the, the third folder, I'm gonna put in sensors. And I'm gonna click okay. That's it. That's all I need to do. That's the define the topic namespace for the MQTT spark plug messages. The next step, of course, is to say, well, where's the broker? Where am I going to send the data to? So in this case, I'll go add MQTT broker. And I'm faced with a, a form here to fill out of where the broker is and what the user pass is and so on and so forth. Well, I don't have a broker yet. So let's go spin one up. I'm going to open up a new tab right over here. And I'm going to, uh, let's go ahead and type in HiveMQ. So this would be the same thing that you could do uh, from your end. Uh, there it is, I'm on the home page of, the, of HiveMQ. And right here over to the right, you can see I've got something called HiveMQ Cloud Basic. So I'm gonna click on that. And it says I can sign up now for free to connect 100 devices. Well, I wanna do that. So I'm gonna click on here and let's see what we got. It says I can either log in or sign up. So let's sign up. We're gonna create a brand new broker and a brand new account. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna put in optowebinar at opto22.com. Great, I'll come up with a reasonable password and sign up. Okay, let's see what happens next. Okay, uh, I agree to the terms of service. Sure, I, have, uh, I always read the things, but this time I won't. <laughs> Okay, and look at this, it says, please click the verification link in the email uh, that was sent to my inbox. Well, okay, let's do this. Let me go ahead and open up my Gmail account. Hey, look at that. 
I've got an email from HiveMQ. So let me go ahead and confirm my account. And you can see it's opening up in a new tab. Well, that's terrific. I'm gonna close some of these other unused tabs that I'm not needing right now and get right back to here. And now I can log in, presumably. So let's go opto webinar at opto22.com. Put in my password. Now this is the admin password. This is just to allow me to log into the, uh, into the cloud system. And uh, there we go. Okay, so it needs a little bit more information. I'll go ahead and uh, I've got something pre-filled form here. I'll just say uh, I'm Opto developer, just a little bit more information about who I am and click continue. Please wait while HiveMQ cloud loads. In just a few seconds, you'll have access to your first HiveMQ cloud cluster. So it's literally spinning up your cloud broker real time. So let's take a look. It says getting, set, uh, getting started. The first thing I need to do is I need to create credentials. These are basically for our MQTT clients or devices. So this device here, which is uh, my Groove Rio, and also this device uh, behind me, which is the Groove Epic, I wanna set up some credentials uh, so that I can actually connect to the broker and start sending data. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna call it Groove. And a password, retype my password. And click add. Oh, good. So I just uh, created an account. Let's go and take a look at that real quick. I'm gonna go here to the access management tab and I can see indeed I've created an active MQTT credential for this username and password, which I'll use. But Jeff over on the East Coast is also gonna wanna connect. Now I could give Jeff this credential and let him log into that, but better still would be to create account credentials for different types of devices that may log in. His is a software application, the Historian, the Axiom product. Mine is a, is a client device. So I'm gonna go ahead and add Jeff into here. So I'm gonna put, uh, create a, a username for him called Canary, and then I'll put in a password. Now, as, a, as you might uh, guess, I've already shared this password uh, with Jeff, so he'll be able to log in from his end. And there you go. I've got uh, two now, two users for my uh, MQTT broker. I'm pretty much in good shape. Last question is, where is the broker? So when we spun, uh, when HiveMQ Cloud spun that broker up, it gave us this URL. So I've got this really nice little clipboard here that I, when I click on it, it'll copy that into my, uh, into my clipboard on my Windows computer. Now I'm gonna go and configure that for the Rio, but I also wanna send it over to Jeff. So I'm gonna drop this into a uh, private chat here, Jeff, and click that. And then I also need to send it to Ben, who's on the call with me. He's gonna say, take that same broker configuration and stick it into the Epic that's behind me so we can get all the Alan Bradley and uh, Siemens tags. So Ben, there you go. And then finally, let's come back to this screen and take a look. We're back to the screen where I needed to configure the broker. Let's go ahead and get that done and get this show on the road, SSL. So I am prefacing the broker address with SSL double forward slash because I wanna connect securely uh, to this broker. I'm gonna control V uh, to paste from the clipboard and then I'm gonna suffix that by putting on the port number. Uh, if you uh, recognize back here in HiveMQ Cloud, that port is a TLS port, 8883. So I'm gonna make sure I put in the 8883 here on the end of my uh, URL. Uh, finally, I'm gonna put in, let's just put in a random um, client ID. This can be whatever you like. Uh, and then of course, now I need to type in the credentials that I created a moment ago on my brand new cloud server. Then I'm gonna go ahead and check the box for SSL. And what this, what's gonna happen next is, is this client connection tries to connect to the uh, cloud broker, it's gonna say, oh, we need to do this SSL. I'm going to make sure that the CA certificates match and they do. This is the good news. When you uh, fire up this cloud broker, all your servers, your certificates, everything are taken care of. And they use a global CA, so I'm just gonna be able to connect directly to it. I'm gonna click OK. Let's uh, not worry about saving that. I have all my uh, forms filled out. I'm ready to go. I'm gonna click Save. And when I do, it says, well, do you wanna start the service? You bet I do. Let's start sending data to the cloud. And here we go. All right. 
So the next step, of course, is, well, we're sending data up to the cloud, up to the MQTT broker from HiveMQ that I just spun up. And according to my screen here, it says it's running. So now I'm going to flip it over to Jeff. So Jeff can connect to the same broker that I just pasted the, or I just sent him the URL to. Uh, and uh, that way we can start uh, taking a look at some of this data that's coming through. So I'll stop my share here. Great. All right, Benson. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate you giving me some credentials. Um, talk a little bit about what you're going to see. Uh, Canary is currently running in the Canary Cloud as a service uh, in our Amazon uh, environment. And so I'm going to need to remote in and provide those credentials that Benson shared with me. Now, typically in the Canary environment, you would just provide those same credentials to your account manager and they would do this step for you. Uh, but I thought it would be nice to show the transparency of really how simple it is because not all of you may want to use the Canary Cloud. You might want to run your own managed historian and whether you choose Canary or another historian that supports Sparkplug B, there's just not that much to do to connect to the broker. Uh, we'll use Splashtop and get started. So I'm remoting in to our Amazon instance here on the East Coast, and I need to use the Canary admin application to configure my login session. My MQTT collector is that configuration point. And when I look at it, I can see that I've already got something pre-configured. We'll come back to that one later. But for now, let's go ahead and run the configuration of what Benson has built for me. I'll create a new group and give it an appropriate name. I'll go ahead and paste in the server information. And we'll change to a secure port. Enable SSL. And now I need to actually subscribe to the topics that I would like to log. So with the Sparkplug specification, I have the ability to say, watch the broker and grab everything. And I do that by entering in the topic SPBV 1.0 slash pound. Now, if I did not want to subscribe to everything, um, I could put in more detailed information, including edge nodes and IDs, and come down to the tag level and only subscribe to a single tag. I could also create multiple subscriptions where I subscribe to different branches um, of the unified namespace. Now for Canary's purposes, I need to know what data set, uh, essentially a collection of tags that I'd like to log this data to. We'll name that Hive MQTT1. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, just log all the tags. And the very last part I need to configure is I need to tell it where my historian lives, what is the machine name. Um, I'm using a decoupled solution here where I'm actually creating my logging session on a different server than my history. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could include uh, filters um, as well. So I could say subscribe to all tags, except, and then use the filtering system uh, to create some rules for exception. But for this demo today, we'll just get started like this. All right, so if I look, I've got my new session created. Uh, it's currently not enabled and it's currently not connected. So let's do that. And just like that, we've enabled it, we've connected to it. We've issued a rebirth on all of the tags in Benson's environment, and we've discovered 150 tags and started logging all 150 tags. Now consider the amount of time that I just spent configuring that logging session. And I think everyone here could say that was fast. Uh, Benson, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share because I bet there's a few things you'd like to do. Uh, along with your data there. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Benson, I'm just checking on my side. I should already have data for you on the Canary Live system. Uh, if you want to go ahead and attach to that. Great. Okay. 
I will uh, get underway here. Let's. Uh, cool. So I'm leaning Vincent, on the. Con you're, yep. you're green lighted for Siemens and your Alan Bradley. Uh, uh, it's all coming through and just streaming. Uh, even your Rio, it's already there. Terrific. So let's let's actually look at this data. What does it look like in the uh, Canary Axiom uh, dashboard? So I'll go ahead and open up a brand new tab here, and I'm going to go to CanaryLabs.com. This is just their homepage. Um, where you can learn more about the uh, Canary uh, Historian and the Axiom tools, but I wanna show it to you. So we're gonna go to Try Canary, this uh, yellow button up here on the top right. Now, if I scroll down here, I have a, a, a choice for a free Axiom demo. So I'm gonna click on that, and then I'm gonna scroll down and make sure I just fill in uh, some contact information uh, and click Submit, and boom, I'm right inside the Axiom web-based interface to start looking at trended data. Now I'll go ahead and log in. Uh, it's all prompted for me. This is just the demo login. So it's a pretty, you can't make a lot of changes and so on, but it does give you this uh, essentially a dashboard of all kinds of things you can do to start to explore uh, the Canary system. Um, so this is all really nice design gallery. Uh, the Academy is all in here, but I wanna actually start from scratch. I wanna start building some trends right now from the data I just started publishing up to this broker. So the first thing I need to do is come up here to the hamburger menu and I'm gonna click on new chart. Now, once I have this new chart created, it's an untitled chart. Now I can go ahead and start adding trends to that, that chart. So let's go ahead and do that. And well, look at this. There's the Hive MQ, uh, MQTT1, uh, Opto22, which was the, remember the group ID that I was publishing all my data on. There's the Groove Rio. That's the one that, of course, that I did. And then Ben put in the broker information on my turbine uh, that's behind me. So first, uh, let's go ahead down to the device ID. There's my sensors. And right there, they all are, including the min, max, and values, the counter, the state. So let's go ahead and grab some of these guys. The first thing I'm going to do is grab the temperature. Actually, I don't want the minimum. I want the value here. I'm going to grab the door sensor and the sensor state. So both the counter and the sensor state. And then let's go ahead and grab this tank level sensor as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and add all those. And that's pretty cool. We'll be able to take a look at that, but actually I'm gonna go ahead and add the PLC's uh, data as well. So I'm gonna come down to the group ID, Opto22, the edge node ID, Opto Turbine, which is right behind me. And lo and behold, there's my tags. Let's go ahead and go to Alan Bradley. And I've got a few different tags here. I'm just going to grab the stack light and the F32 waveform, which is just a waveform that's being generated in the PLC. I'll go ahead and add those. And then I'm going to come down here to the Siemens PLC. I'm going to grab the green stack light. And just so you know, if you look behind me, uh, I have a red and green stack light above these PLCs. Those are the data I'm, bring the data I'm bringing in and publishing to the broker. And then also on top of my uh, Siemens PLC, right here at the very top is a little thermocouple. So let's go ahead and grab the temperature from that Siemens PLC as well. And I think I have everything I want. I've got quite a few pins on this trend and there they all are. And just in a few minutes, uh, it all worked, <laughs> which is great. So let's go down here to uh, minutes. Uh, let me change that to five minutes to make this a little bit more interesting. Uh, and there you go, I'm starting to pull data in. So let's take uh, uh, my temperature probe here, which is the very top trend. We should start seeing that go up. I'm gonna take my door sensor and actually let me switch my screen here so you guys can see this. Um, I'm gonna take my door sensor and start moving it back and, forth, back and forth. And we're gonna start seeing those states change. Now this is on a public website uh, for the Canary Historian back East getting all its data from my devices here in my office live in real time. And then finally, we got to play around with the tank level sensor because that's just too much fun. You know, that is, that's the cool thing about doing this. We actually get to work with real sensors and, and real signals. So there you go. You can see all that being trended. And then indeed behind me, uh, let's switch over to that screen. I've got my live demo. Fun, right? But it'd be more fun if you could do it. So I've got a special treat for you. Uh, as we just described, and you saw in some of the previous um, uh, uh, slides from Ian, 
this is what I'm working with right here. I've got an Epic moving data to HiveMQ. I've got my Groove Rio sending sensor data to HiveMQ, and we're showing Canary. But I've also got this little OPC UA client called Groove View running on some other uh, server uh, here in the building, actually, and it's exposed to the internet. And this server actually has public access to it. So in just a moment, Ben is going to drop in uh, a URL for you to log in just like I'm doing right now with trial and Opto 22. And when I click sign in, I come to this screen. So this screen is actually also getting data from those brokers um, and able to display everything on the page. And there's a reason why I wanted to do this because you're gonna be able to actually turn on and off the stack lights from your own browser to see this work and see the trending of that information right on the device. But the other reason why I wanted to bring this up for you now is because we've demonstrated that MQTT is pretty straightforward in terms of the data uh, payload and the topic namespace. It's actually pretty simple to configure. It's actually really simple to configure a cloud broker to start moving this data up into, uh, up into the broker for other applications to consume. And we've also demonstrated that it's 100% secure. The devices beneath me here are only outbound, same with the rear, are only outbound access, no inbound ports set up at all. So it's, we've done security, we've done uh, ease of use, we've done scalability, but what about performance? The, the reality is you won't do any of this if it's not fast. So we're gonna show you how fast it is. I've got these couple of buttons right here on the screen. And if I click on them, uh, we talked briefly about bi-directional communications for MQTT. So from this client, I'm gonna send a, a message. It looks like somebody's already is logged in. Uh, send a message from here, in this case, the AB Red Stack Light, and three, two, one, click. It actually happens faster on this live video than even in the web browser. It's astonishingly fast. The, the, it's sub-second responses. And in this case, I'm going to a server in Germany, back down to a, another client in, uh, in the East Coast. Let's go see that trending. So I'm gonna come back to here. And indeed, the change of the stack lights is reflected here uh, and temperature from the Siemens, <laughs> it's all there. Uh, ben, go ahead and drop that into the uh, folks so they can actually log in and play around with this as well. I'll leave this screen up on my, um, on my uh, personal video so you can see trends and see what's going on for you guys while I pass it back over to uh, Jeff for some even more fun, uh, what you can start doing with this data. Thanks, Benson. Jeff, it's all you. All right. <clears throat> well, I appreciate that, Benson, and thank you. Um, so last thing I want to kind of show is the idea of how we can take the unified namespace that the broker provides us, essentially a data model already, and create an asset model uh, around that namespace. And so within Canary, what we've done is created some simple rules that identify um, subnodes of the unified namespace uh, and the tags or the sensors that are in those subnodes and labeled them as an asset. Now that means that if I build a new application, I can use Canary's uh, Axiom reporting module for asset templates and assign my asset model to that template. And so I've named this asset demo just for this webinar, and I've generically called the child assets an asset. <laughs> and uh, so basically this is an asset of Benson's studio, his example tags. And so I can take this block and I can design a little layout uh, using my uh, properties or some of my, uh, perhaps some of my uh, gauges. So let's do that. We'll drop on a donut gauge. We're going to link the donut gauge over to his temperature value. And I'll change a little bit of my formatting around the donut gauge. We'll take it to a high scale of say 150. And for fun, we'll set a red limit if it should go over a value of 100. Um, perfect. Uh, so there we go. That's now set. How about a spark line? specific to that temperature value for the last five minutes. Then we'll turn our scaling on also. 
There we go. And I think the only thing that we need to continue to add on here is maybe just a train graph. Um, and for the train graph, we'll just put on two simple tags. Let's do our rat and, oh, I don't know. How about the, um, the red light? And same thing, we're gonna pick up five minutes there because there's just no more history because we're doing this live. Okay, so that's now done. Um, there is a neat feature here uh, that allows me <clears throat> to sort and filter um, all of my assets. So right now this card, this gray card represents the only asset that's in my model. Um, if I wanted to sort, if there was multiple assets here, I could sort those. And so I could do like a sort by and then put in my tag name. Um, we have temp value and we could make that descending. The only issue is right now is I'm sorting one of one. And I can see the last time that sort ran was when I triggered it at 1046. Uh, that's my local time. I can refresh the sort manually. And I can also say, run this refresh every say 60 seconds. So here's what's happened now. Uh, I've built this with an automatic refresh. I'm gonna go ahead and save uh, my application as well. I'll just save it here as HiveMQ. And when I refresh this, I can see that my last update was uh, 24 seconds past. Well, remember that I had this previous MQTT logging session configured. If I switch back over to my configuration screen, I'm going to enable this now. And it'll automatically go find other tags on another broker that I've subscribed to. And those tags got picked up and logged into the historian. Now, when that happens, the historian is automatically in the background going to run a process that says, go discover any new tags that this asset model has been built on top of. So the tags are coming in the data sets that my asset model is watching. And just like that, as we discover those new assets, we add them automatically, hands were in the air, um, <laughs> without any manual process on my side, and we sort them by the value. So what did we do? We've enabled automatic discovery of new tags because of the power of MQTT. We have been able to build assets on the unified namespace that the spark plug uh, spec provides us. And through the power of Canary and Axiom, we are creating condition-based reporting automatically. Um, and that's the power of enabling IIoT with the right tool set and technology available to you. That's some impressive dashboarding there, Jeff. Well done. All right, so are we um, are we done with the demo? Are we we've I think we've we've shown everything we wanted to. So um, this is pretty awesome stuff. Uh, Jeff, could I uh, share my screen? Or actually, no, I think I can. Okay. So I want to want to quickly wrap up the 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 the, the, the webinar part, uh, the kind of the presentation portion of the the webinar, and then so we can get to to Q and A. Um, so, so in summary, I, like kind of, I think it's a kind of an incredible accomplishment to kind of go from nothing to kind of something, some kind of those incredible dashboards that Jeff is showing, in basically thirty minutes. Um, and I think really what kind of what enables this is a couple of things. One is the cloud managed services. I hope you kind of appreciate that that just really simplified getting started. That that you didn't actually have to worry about installing a broker anywhere or installing Canary anywhere. It was just there it was working. So so kind of no software installation required. That being said, the kind of HiveMQ and Canary off, uh, offer on-premise software. So you, if you want to install it and kind of, um, in, in your own machines, we certainly have that those those options too. Um, I think Spark Plug is really the key here, where it makes it possible to integrate out of the box, right? Um, kind of the tags were showing up immediately. There's nothing, no no work being done there. It's, it was just it just works. And really, kind of the extensibility of, of Spark Plug, the Spark Plug architecture is really, I think, the key kind of uh, message that we want to convey here is that kind of you can now add 
hardware, software to your system, and you're not making any changes, right? Kind of Jeff showed you the auto discovery of, of a new asset coming on. It, it just works. It, that's part of the system. Um, so I think it's, it's very powerful for that, for, from that perspective. Um, and I think kind of really kind of Sparkplug is an emerging standard that we are seeing an real uptake in terms of the vendor and and the end user community um so this is a, a diagram kind of the sparkbook landscape diagram that we published um it's it's on the hive and q site where with some of the the the, the vendors that are, uh, are providing uh spark plug solutions today are committed to providing a spark plug solution in, in in the near future so so it's a it's a growing community um certainly i uh, will put links uh, make links available to get more information about spark plug um available to um I, we have a kind of i'm not going to go into details but we'll send out uh links to um in an email follow-up email to everyone because i really want to get to q a uh, about kind of some resources from hive and q cloud opto 22 um and canary so these will all be available to you as a follow-up um but really what i'd like to try and do is, is get to q a um we're going to start a poll. Jay Shri is going to start a poll for, to help us kind of better understand the audience. Um, but with that, um, so Ben, why don't you kind of, kind of take us through the Q and A, the live Q and A? Um, yeah, thanks, for us. Ian. Um, so we've got. I'd, I'd like uh, one question for Benson and uh, one for Jeff. So we'll start with you, Benson. Uh, it's one of your favorite questions. Um, basically, it said you said the communication is bi-directional but there's no inbound ports. So how is the magic of bi-directionality going on? Oh, that's a great question. And one we get often, frankly, uh, the way it works is this, uh, as my device here on, uh, in this case, the Groove Rio establishes a connection up to that broker, it persists that connection. In other words, it leaves it always on. And so as I'm sending messages up, I'm also sending the state of this device. And this is why MQTT Spark Plug B is what's called stateful. Uh, so we always know the status of all devices in the system. Uh, but because that, that is persisted, if another client goes ahead and subscribes, or I should say publishes a data topic that this guy is, uh, has a tag for, he will consume that uh, message, that published message right back. So not only is he publishing, He's also subscribing to his own tags for any changes. And that's exactly how we did the stack lights. Uh, by sending a message to change the stack lights, we did that over bi-directional communications. So still all outbound, no inbound ports, no exposure uh, to the internet, yet we're uh, able to make bi-directional communications over that persisted connection. Excellent. Um, Jeff, we got one, one for you and then one for you, Ian. So uh, Jeff, we had a a question, uh, and I'm going to mangle two questions together here. So bear with me, Jeff. Um, first of all, we, we had a question about connecting um, SQL data to um, uh, to Canary, whether or not that's doable. And sort of on that same sort of topic, it, it wasn't clear to a few people how you connected uh, HiveMQ's broker to mm -hmm. Axiom. How, so which which sure. connector? How did you connect that up in the live demo? Okay, um, I'll answer both in one stream. Uh, so Canary can read data uh, from uh, MQTT Sparkplug, from OPC, and from other SQL databases. Uh, we have a logger that we can essentially configure to read data in times, uh, time series data uh, as it appears in SQL databases and move that over to our historian. Uh, it, all of these collectors follow the exact same mechanism. We have a uh, data collector UI that allows you to configure the login session that moves it through our store and forward into the historian database. Now to answer the second part of that question, the historian database, um, all queries that come into the historian come through a single endpoint called views. And so Axiom connects to a historian via views. Uh, when I typed in the address canarylive.canarylabs.com, what I was really doing was calling an Axiom server that has already be con been configured to know where the Canary historian is that it is getting data from. So when I log in to Canary Live uh, with my credentials, my user credentials um, are then passed to views, which authenticates and authorizes what I have access to. In this case, I and Benson 
have access to all of the historical data found on that historian, all of the different data sets and asset models, but it is permissions based. So you can essentially, based on the user, choose what they see and how they see it uh, down to the tag level. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it was the credentials that I was uh, a little hazy on. Um, Ian, we've actually got two questions for you, if you don't mind, uh, and I'm interested sure. in this first one as well. What's the criteria to select Hive on-premise versus in the cloud? Uh, and sort of coupled in with that is a question about um, linking Hive to uh, Kafka. Sure. Um, so it, it really depends on, on kind of the, the use case people, uh, kind of our customers have. Um, so some, some of our customers have their own data centers, they're installing HiveMQ in, in their own data centers. So that would be kind of the on-premise version. Um, many of those customers are actually taking uh, kind of moving their data centers to the cloud. So they're hosting uh, their services um, on Azure, or AWS, or, or Google. Um, and so they basically take HiveMQ and, and manage it themselves there. Um, then we've I just recently introduced the HiveMQ cloud where we manage the broker for you. So I think it really comes down to is if, if you want to have if you don't want to have the, to worry about managing the broker yourself, um, you'd use the managed broker, the Hive cloud, cloud managed service. Um, if you've got the internal staff to manage your, your assistance yourself, then, then you'd actually probably go, go towards um, kind of the on-premise version. Um, but but there's, there's, kind of, there's the three options where you put it on your own hardware and your own data center on the cloud, Hive and Q, or use our managed service. Um, so in terms of this, the, the Kafka and, and uh, specifically about Spark pay, payloads, so Kafka is a very popular event streaming um, software, open source event streaming um, software that many, lots of enterprises are using for sharing information, for sharing data events um, through, throughout kind of their be different backend systems. HiveMQ actually has a, what we call an enterprise extension that allows you to, to basically forward um, can publish Kafka messages from the broker. So you can take a MQT Spark plug message, um, the extension would convert that into a Kafka message and send it into a Kafka cluster. cluster. And conversely, we can, um, the extension can subscribe to um, Kafka messages that wants, wants to kind of send out to the, the, the devices. So it can subscribe to those Kafka messages. It converts the Kafka message into an MQT message and then put, puts it back out to the device. So it's, it's, it's pretty flexible for, for doing that. Sweet. Ben, I think you're on mute. Sorry, yes, um, Ian, we're, we're getting very close. Uh, Garrick and I are still uh, mopping up a couple of text answers here, but um, we're getting very close to the top of the end, uh, hour here, Ian, so. Um, okay, do you wanna, is there one or two more? Do you wanna just, is that we wanna um, handle or? Yeah, here's, here's one perhaps uh, back to you, Benson. If the originating device does not support change, uh, change transmission, um, how does Sparkplug know about the, how does it know to provide updates or does it just change the polling rate? So I'm not sure I entirely understand uh, the question. Well, so if, if you've got a very static temperature that's within okay. your dead bin uh, and it's not publishing, how does Sparkplug handle that? You know, because it knows it's still there because of state, right? Right, and that's the key. Uh, the key is the state. So the, with both of those pieces of information, we know that the device is still online and we know that the data has not changed. Uh, and when it does change, of course, it'll publish a message to do so. Um, there are some methods that uh, you could do to, you know, to force published uh, changes, but generally that's not uh, necessary. Uh, we don't see that uh, implemented very often. And that's particularly important on something like a pump. A pump will be <laughs> off or on for maybe a long period of time. Uh, no need to publish messages as long as we know the state hasn't changed. All right, so I, th so I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, so thank you everyone um, for, for kind of attending the webinar. Um, I hope you found it uh, useful, use for use of your time. As I said, we'll follow up with um, an, an email with some links for you to do, for, uh, for, um, for you to, to kind of have for, for additional information. 
um, we'll send a, a link to the presentation and to the mm -hmm. the recording um, out to um, we will also try and follow up um, if your question didn't get answered we'll try and follow up with a, a private email to you to, to answer the question directly so we'll try and get everything uh, answered as as best as we can so and but also um, feel free to reach out to any of the vendors here if you if you'd like to more information so um uh benson ben and jeff and gareth uh, thank you very much for for all the help that that you provide today it's been a great great experience and it's amazing what we could accomplish in 30 minutes all right <laughs> great time right. thank you everybody take care bye-bye yeah thank, thank you everyone thank you